Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Welcome to the attendees. Welcome to the panelists. Um, we've got a super hot topic for discussion today. Um, everyone is thinking about fundraising all the time. So um, today we're talking specifically about raising your first round as a startup in women's health and wellness. And honestly, I'm very proud of the panel we have today. Um, and I think we're going to be able to answer a lot of really burning questions on the topic. Um, my name is Karina. I will be moderating the panel and um, I'm the co-founder at Femtech Lab. I think we have quite a few uh, new founders here today from our community. So I'll explain a little bit what Femtech Lab is and then I'll, I'll introduce our incredible panel. So Femtech Lab is uh, an accelerator and it's an ecosystem specifically for uh, early stage startups in women's health and wellness. We have um, about a hundred amazing expert advisors involved. We have um, over 200 invest investment partners, uh, all excited about Femtech and women's health. Um, we run an accelerator program twice a year in the spring and in the fall. We've had 27 companies graduated so far. Charlie here from Ancestors is one of them, we are proud to say. And um, yeah, the next program is going to start in, um, in the fall. Aside from the accelerator, we um, are trying to do more and more sessions like this, uh, where we bring in really early stage founders and uh, try to unlock you know, the questions, the challenges um, around you know, everything that they're thinking about. And of course, fundraising is one of them. Um, so let's, let's get into it. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, first of all, we have Dipali Nangia. Uh, she's a partner at Speed Invest, uh, focusing on female and underrepresented founders. Uh, when I got into Femtech two years ago, it didn't take too long for me to come across Dipali. Uh, it was very clear that it was one of the investors to know in the space. Um, she's the co-founder of Alma Angels, which is an investment network supporting female entrepreneurs, winner of Angel Investor of the Year. Um, honestly, it's um, a very, very active player and supporter in women's health and uh, female founders in general. So awesome to have you, Dipali. Um, Thank you, next, Karina. Yeah. Um, next, we have uh, Yeva Tarasova. Um, we've worked with Yeva now on a couple of cohorts of startups together. She's a, an investment director at Wharton Asset Management, which is a family office. They invest in biotech, life science, consumer products, startups, and scale-ups. Um, Yeva is also an angel investor with a focus in femtech. She's been an amazing supporter for our startups during the program. And um, I would say one of the more sort of direct to the point uh, mentors that would give real advice, <laughs> which is incredibly valuable for, for founders. Next, yeah, nice. to have you. Um, next, we've got Olivia Brooks, uh, an investment associate at Founders Factory. Um, I'm a big fan of Founders Factory in general. I think it's um, an amazing accelerator fund supporting founders um, in the UK and, and all over. Um, they invest in health tech, early stage health tech um, and mental health. They've worked with in interesting companies across different topics, including psychedelics, digestive health, digital health. And um, I think you guys have supported over 200 companies to date. So that's just incredible, incredible impact. So you've seen, you've seen so much and really excited to also get your perspective today, Olivia. Good to have you. Finally, last but definitely not least, we've got Charlie Cohen from Ancestors. Um, we're incredibly proud to have Ancestors as one of our alums uh, at Femtech Lab. Um, Charlie is the CEO at Ancestors. Um, they have completed by now three successful funding rounds. They raised over 1.5 million altogether, including a successfully oversubscribed crowdfunding campaign. And Sisters is one of the, I think, maybe I'm biased, but I think one of the most exciting uh, consumer brands in, in femtech and menstrual care. Um, they're really doing things differently. They're B Corp certified. If you have heard of, of this certification, you might know how incredibly difficult that is and how committed you have to be as a company and a brand to, um, to sustainability in order to actually get that done. So um, really one of the most amazing brands in the space. It's, and it's usually like a consumer myself when you walk into a store and seeing Ancestors products is a breath of fresh air when it comes to products and women's health. So awesome to have you here, Charlie, as well, sharing your insights. Yeah, great to be here. It's a nice intro. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to 
stop sharing the intro slide so I can see all of your faces a bit more clearly. Let's get into it. So um, I've had a couple of questions prepared to get us started. Uh, we also welcome uh, Q&A. Um, we've actually had some questions being submitted over email, but if you think of something um, to all of the attendees, just drop them in the Q&A. We wanna make this as practical as possible um, and really kind of get from theory to like tactics and, and, and insights and, and hacks and you know uh, quite specific things. So um, let's get started, Charlie, with you. Um, you know, being a, being a founder, and um, you know, let's imagine that you're raising your your first round. <laughs> what what is on your mind? How do you approach it? What are your considerations? How do you strategize about it? Um, can you just walk us through what would go through your mind? you know, if you were to raise a first round now as a femtech startup? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think that one of the things with fundraising is everyone sees it to be like a really complicated process. Um, and in reality, I think as a, as a founder in a business, if you've got to the stage where you're building a product or you're generating some revenue, you've probably done things that are even more complex. So it's something that I think a lot of people are afraid of um, because they believe it's sort of hidden behind a lot of dark walls. But in reality, when you get into it, uh, it's actually quite a simple process to go through. Um, I think that the first thing that's really important, like with any project and fundraising is just another project, right? Is the preparation phase, right? Uh, so making sure you have all your investment materials ready, right? Uh, so that's your pitch deck. And that can be in various forms. You know, you might have a long form deck, uh, which goes through like in detail your business. Um, and then you might have a teaser deck, which just allows you to essentially send something through to someone maybe you've never met before who can open it up and be excited in the first few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got the financial side of things. So making sure your financial model, your business plan is there. Um, I wouldn't say that's necessarily always essential for your first round, uh, but you at least want to have some financials in place so you can show the prospect for your business. Um, and then the last part I'd say is really important is to make sure you know what makes you different, right? Um, and you need to really take yourself outside of your business to do that um, because you know, you're ingrained in it every day. Um, and it's very easy to think that you have an obvious like USP or multiple USPs but you need to really put the hat on of an investor and think, okay, they know nothing about your business. They're probably going to spend a maximum of 10 minutes looking at it before they think whether they're going to progress it or not. And you've got to really wow them with what is the USP for that. Um, and then I'd say the last part uh, is on outreach. So, mm -hmm. you know, build your network early, right? Even if you're not thinking about fundraising now, right? Uh, think about uh, who you know, who can support you with connecting you to certain people. You know, uh, I think when I look at the panel here, I think I, I've at least had conversations with everyone at some stage. Um, and whether that individual is interested in investing in your business or not, uh, they absolutely will have the ability to connect you with others. And your network grows almost like a spider web, right? Uh, and you, you, can't, you can't foresee where a relationship is going to take you. But in the end, at least my experience, ancestors, and this may not be reflective of everyone's fundraising experience, and this is now my third business raising money for, um, is the ones you predict to be the most fruitful tend to be the least, uh, and the ones you predict to be the least fruitful tend to be the most. So uh, as I said, that's probably my, my biggest piece of advice, as I said, when you go into a fundraise. Wow, that's interesting. But the I think the network is an amazing point. And also, um, kind of what is your USP? Can you um, actually maybe... It's a good um, good segue to um, to bring in the investor um, side of the panel into this. So when you're evaluating a startup, and let's say you know you, you you've received an email or you've you've received that first pitch deck, that first encounter you have with the with a founder, what is it that goes through your mind, um, and what is it that you're looking for, and what are the things that really catch your eye and want you to have a conversation with them? Uh, Dipali, could you kick us off? Sorry, I was just going to say that Charlie said it all. I don't think there's anything left for me to say. He's given like <laughs> all the best advice. But, um, you know, when I uh, first see a pitch, it's actually very interesting because as, as an investor, you have such little time. As a founder, you have very little time. Even as an investor, you probably, like you said, spend a few minutes on every pitch deck and you want that to capture, you know, your interest. Uh, so I almost feel that even the blurb before you open the pitch deck, like if I got a really well-written email as to why this is interesting, the opportunity, a little bit about the founders, how much they're raising, because that almost helps to establish founder-investor fit without even me opening the pitch deck. So. 
uh, I think two years ago, I invested cold in a founder. She reached out to me on LinkedIn. She said, you know, I know you like these types of businesses. She's building a bioplastics company. And I was like, I can't believe that. It's great that she's done research on, you know, what I'm interested in. Most of the time I get a, a you know, pitch deck from a man and I'm like, clearly this person has not even read what my LinkedIn says, right? But she had looked at the companies that I'd invested in, which are very clearly listed on my LinkedIn and said, yes, this is the kind of investor I want because she's interested. She's invested in things that are similar. She understands that that I can be value add to her in a certain way, or at least I have interest in. So I think that is quite important even before you start you know, that whole process of reaching out to investors. And then when I am looking at a deck or looking at that email, I obviously, the first slide I go to is this team slide because you're at the end of the day, these businesses are very early and you're investing in people, right? So for me, uh, you know, depends on the type of business I've invested in, mostly first time founders. But, you know, VC does have a bias towards second time founders. I will say that quite loud. Everybody knows that. But, you know, there are people investing in first time founders. Um, and so I would like to see what they've done before, you know, if they're building. So the bioplastics business, does she have, you know, has she commercialize something internally at a corporate or you know how does she have bio does she have a bio background has she studied this in university you know that kind of stuff um who else is on the team um it is very early usually it's one maybe two people you know two two and a half people but you still want to get to know them uh, and, and that jumps right out and i also don't like pitch decks where there's no last name or no LinkedIn link, even, I mean, no LinkedIn link is still okay because I will look, if the business looks interesting to me, I will open LinkedIn and check out the founders, but it should have a last name because if there's no last name, then I have zero incentive to, even if I open LinkedIn, it'd be like, Charlie, Charlie and sisters, you know, that's what I usually tend to type on LinkedIn then, right? To try and find who he is. Um, but so it's very important. I think the founder page is very important. Any advisors that are relevant in there are important. And then I look at obviously the market, the market size. And like uh, oftentimes if I've seen too many femtech companies doing the same thing, it's kind mm -hmm. of like femtech fatigue, right? You're like, oh, yet another business trying to solve for the same problem in a similar way. So then I try and find USP. But really it's all about the people. I usually take a lot of calls because I find the people really interesting or the problem they're solving for really interesting. And then it's trying to figure out, is it the right person to solve this problem? Or is it, sometimes you meet a founder and you're like, I wish there was solving for a different problem because I would have invested. But it's really the founder, then it's the founder market fit. So mm -hmm. initially founder investor fit, then founder market fit. And beyond that, then I, you know, look at things, talk about things in the call to really understand how much research they've done, where they are in terms of stage and how they want to monetize doesn't necessarily mean that they have lots of financials, but how are they thinking about it? Yeah, super, super interesting. I think the fact that you keep like highlighting that it's all about the people is actually um, quite important because so many founders to them, it, it's completely new, just the idea of how much, um, that's scrutiny, but how, how interested investors are in them, like what is it that they bring to the table, their background, why they're doing this, and it's like hidden at the end of the pitch deck or maybe not even there. Um, and um, I think it's super important to highlight that you're selling not just the idea or the market, but yourself as the founder in your first round, 100%. Um, that's super, yeah, that's very valuable. Yeva, what about you? Do you have any? There is so much uh, focus on you know founders whenever like you're reading this first email or even having the first call because in the end of the day, like. I'd say 99% of startups do pivot. Like the first pitch you have with the investor, you know, five years down the road is never really the same company again. That's why we're really interested to actually get to know who are you as a person and like, what's your, are you really just enthusiastic to be a founder and entrepreneur or do you really have what it takes? And, and this kind of lifestyle is, you know, for you. Because what I've noticed uh, that in the last sort of couple of years, you get so many founders and when you really ask them like, but why are you doing this, what you're doing? And they all say, oh, I just want to have a business of my own. Like everybody's a startup founder, everybody's an entrepreneur. I just want to try it out. Like, but nobody really understands that this is like more than a full-time job. And then, you know, there'll be so many sort of downfalls and problems that, that, that you can't even imagine at that early point. But I think one of the interesting things we, that we should point out here um, is whenever you're pitching to any investor or anybody at all, you have to remember you're selling you know, your proposition. So it has to be crystal clear. It's a clearly identified problem. It's a clearly identified solution. And you know, kind of to sum up this all is like, what is your trick? Why you're the right person to actually solve this problem? Just be, beyond the point that you know I had this problem at some point and 
that's it, you know, and I don't really know how to put things together after that. So um, I'd say for founders, really get your pitch clear in like this elevator mode, like the 30 seconds, one minute. So you can really clearly identify what, like what makes you different and what your product is really about. Because most of investors and people in general don't really have too much time to listen to things that they're not really interested in. So you wanna kind of eliminate this and get to the point um, directly. Um, another important point here is the, what Dipali has mentioned about uh, some people really reaching out to investors without having done the homework on them. So I think making sure that the, the investor you are reaching out to is the right investor, that's like the first step for any kind of company, not only the femtech. Um, it's sometimes also really um, doing the homework beyond just, oh, I've read somewhere about this investor, they sound like the right person and like what they've said somewhere I can really relate to. Like, um, so there was an example, a couple of weeks ago, there was um, a, fem- a male founder who reached out to me and saying, I think my company is ideal for you because um, your investor rationale of investing um, Below the waist above the knee is exactly what I'm doing. And then and I actually emailed him back and saying, so what, what are you actually doing? He said, I have a fertility treatment for cows. And I was like, but how is that relevant? I invest in women. I've met them as well. <laughs> well yeah, I mean, but it's kind of funny, right? You give them like one thing and then they come out with a completely different like reason why is this right? And I'm like, well, I mean, this is kind of really extreme, <laughs> right? So there is a borderline, like kind of do not try to read between the lines too much because otherwise, you know, any kind of company can fit into this strategy, right? Um, and I think um, another really important, important point to sum up here is really think what's your trick. Like, do not take the nose really personally because just think about it. whenever you're pitching to somebody and, and put themselves in, in, put yourself in, into their shoes and think, would you give actually money to me for this? Is that the best way how I'm going to monetize and return my capital with this investment? And I think sometimes like founders get really self-absorbed thinking that, yes, I am the best person, you know, to back and I'm the best, you know, I have the best product and everything. But from investors' perspective, when you're seeing so many companies in one place and so many various opportunities, just think that like they're choosing not you because you're not, they haven't chosen you not because you're not the best person. It's just maybe you're not the best person against somebody else at that particular moment of choice. Mm-hmm. Because in the end of the day, um, whilst every single investor here and everywhere else, I'm sure, is aspiring to do good to the world and really change for the better place, we're all also looking for returns. And if your business is not convincing enough to generate that return, then there is no chance for your raising investment. Yeah, Olivia, you're, you're nodding. Anything to add? Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot has, has been covered that I fully agree with here. Um, I think... You know, the other thing on on the people side of things, obviously, we invest super, super early at, at the stage that, that we operate at Founders Factory. But the passion for, for the problem that's that's being worked on is also just massively important. A um, couple of the recent investments that I made are, are people that really identify with the problem themselves. And it's not that they've necessarily built something in that sector before, but they just it, what they're working on is going to motivate them every single day um, to, to solve to solve that problem. Um, so I would add that to, to the kind of experience side of things. Um, but yeah, it's not necessarily that there has to be prior in, uh, prior founding experience, but you know, we, we look at building experience perhaps internally in a, in a company or in, in initiatives that you've done outside of um, work as well and that kind of that side of things. Um, and I mean, on that, the kind of first conversation we obviously as as Dipali said we have such a short amount of time and so it's rare that we will have from our perspective have that first meeting as as a pitch it will most of the time be we'll receive the deck beforehand have a look through the deck and then spend that 30 minutes or so just covering all areas of the business from the market the traction the, the people obviously in depth and so that's um that's mainly what we will spend our time on um and Obviously, traction can can be in different areas at this point. It might be in, in partnerships, it might be in in, in customers, um, or it might be just in kind of initial interest that you, you've you've gained. Um, but what I would say as well is is that initial meeting is also very much for the founder to understand if this investor is a fit for them, um, because at the end of the day, that's very much what you need to be working out from a strategic standpoint if if this is the right investor for you. So. I will also spend a fair amount of that time trying to talk about Founders Factory and what we can offer um, so that that this founder understands if we are a fit for them. Um, as much as if you interview for a job, you want to work out if that job is you know, the right fit for you. So I think that's something that, that founders need to work out as well as is where can this investor help me strategically um, as well as me selling what I'm working uh-huh. on. 
Yeah, to Olivia's point, I do agree agree with that. And to be honest, that happens more in the market that we've just been through where a lot of founders actually have, uh, you know, it, it is more like a seller's market. I think it's now yeah. shifting to a buyer's market. So it depends on the market dynamics, yeah. obviously. But yes, uh, most VCs were pitching to founders rather than the other way around in the bull run that we had, which is now changed. But I also find female founders in any case, have to be less fussy about those things because it's really hard for them to raise uh, more generally. So while I do think it's important, I just feel they don't have, I don't know, that Love privilege it. or yeah. they don't have that uh, luxury for want of a better word to be able to do that. I often find that that doesn't happen with them as much. Yeah, Not that it shouldn't, but it, they just don't have that luxury. It is, it is very, it's very true. And it's, it's a sad reality, obviously the, 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 the kind of the struggles of, women and underrepresented founders will have when when raising actually also um since since you brought this up in terms of like change in the markets environment i don't want to get too much into what's happening um in it but i think it's good to address um what you just said dipali in a sense that there's been like a certain era where capital was was cheaper was easier i'm sure a lot of female founders don't feel that way but you know, that's how the, the market has been. And now things are shifting. There's a bit of panic online. Obviously, Y Combinator sent that email. Um, is there anything, you know, if, again, if you're a founder raising your first round early stage in women's health, is there anything you should do differently? Any Anything different you should do in positioning yourself as an investment product um, to people that are giving you capital? I mean, if you're raising your first round, you're still at the very start of the journey, right? So it's slightly different than if you're raising a seed round or a seed extension, et cetera. Because right. at that point, then metrics become really important and metrics are in fashion for the next few years, right? So I think that um, if you're building really early, I, would, I think things such as consumer, you know, I, I think a lot of investors are going to now shy away from given we're going into a, you know, down cycle. So those kinds of businesses will find it harder. I feel like um, people, investors will be thinking about, is this really, just, is this spend really discretionary or non-discretionary? You know, if somebody has to really worry about where their income is coming from and that things that the basic expenses like food, et cetera, are more expensive, then would they really spend on this additional item, right? right, right. So, like so that nice is something, car. exactly. Mm -hmm. So that is something to think about, which we think about all the time to be honest, but I think more so, more so in a recessionary environment. Um, but again, if you're building, I think it's, the, so the, you know, you'll be pitching the same way. It's still very early. Maybe some, I think a lot of femtech businesses are community, you know, they start off as community. And I often find that is also hard to monetize, you know, how, how many community businesses that we know that have, you know, I can think of GitHub or I can think of even, I was thinking last night, there were one or two more, but not many community businesses have managed to monetize so you know that is obviously a question that will come up is what is the business model how will this monetize even though we are you know several years away from it but um, uh, I would say that you know trying to raise um, you know not you know obviously you want to raise as much as possible but I also we are going into a market where um, valuations will come down so making sure you're not giving away too much of your cap table um, because now funds will want a higher ownership, but you want to just make sure that you're cognizant that you're not giving away too much because that's the other thing I find from female founders and people of color that they cap tables by the time they get to seed and seed extension are really not looking very interesting, not giving away money, you know, just not giving away your equity without getting anything meaningful in return is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. And me, for me, meaningful is hard cash. Yeah, you know, yeah. so uh, getting a good amount of cash for the equity that you're giving away and having long term investors, having people that who are, you know, not bargain hunters, people who've been doing investing for many years, you know, you know, strong angels will come in at this time to help bridge strong family offices will come in because they're more patient capital. Uh, those are pockets of ca capital to reach out to. And also, obviously, like Charlie had done, you know, to reach out to your customers. Sometimes customers can be your best, you know, investors because you learn so much from them as well. But I don't think there's an easy answer. I think I wish there was something uh, that I could say, but it's a whole bunch of things that you need to be yeah. thinking about. No, but that, that's uh, it just sounds like a tightening up kind of thing across everything. Yeah. Um, actually, now that we sort of started talking a little bit about what kind of investors to reach out to, 
Um, Charlie, it would be good to also hear your perspective on the whole outreach piece. How, um, how do you approach what have you found working when it comes to outreaching to investors? Like, is it about like numbers, you know, do you build out like a long list and, you know, go on LinkedIn and, and, and reach out to a bunch of people? Is it more that you go and try to meet people individually and get introductions? Like what, what have you found to work best when it comes to finding new investors to talk to? Yeah, I mean, I think for our first round, uh, I mean, like it's 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 a combination it's a it's a combination of a numbers game and trying to sort of really understand your investors. I think, like the best piece of advice I ever got, and we definitely uh, we utilize in all of our rounds now, is to really sort of like write the profile of the investor you want, and then search for those investors. Um, and most investors who are active, uh, either whether they're institutional or individuals uh, or family offices, right, um, most of them will be quite vocal about what they like to invest in, right, uh, and that changes over time as well, right, uh, so what someone was investing in five years ago might not be what they invest in now. Um, also have a look at their prior investments they've made uh, in the last year, I would say, uh, last, well, even the last six months. Have they made any investments? Are they active? What have they been into? And does that correlate with sort of what you've read about what they're interested in investing in? Um, angels, I would say, are much more specific about what they invest in. I would say institutionals uh, tend to have a much more a much broader mandate. Obviously, that does vary depending on the institution you look at. Um, but uh, it means it can be a bit harder to really narrow down whether you really fit their, their mandate. But then I would, again, look at their portfolio. Is there businesses in adjacent sectors that look similar to yourself? Um, and in terms of, you know, how to outreach, as I said, like there's LinkedIn works, right? As much as people say it doesn't, it does work. Uh, cold outreach, uh, if you can, as said. Uh, but the, I'd say the most, the shortest way to raising money, uh, or at least get that first meeting, is to speak to other founders, right? To understand their cap tables um, and see if there's any investors on there they think would be interesting for you. Um, that's not going to work for your competitors, obviously, right? Uh, but within you know adjacent sectors, that can be really, really beneficial. And found intros, they they work the best. Amazing, actually, that's, that, that, that's a really good point. <laughs> that does work the best, also from what we've seen as well. Um, already some interesting questions in the chat. I think maybe it would be good to start weaving them into the conversation. Um, so a question around having a CTO, actually something I've noticed in femtech and women's health specifically, I don't know if you all have, is that um, not as often as in like fintech, do you have the founding team that has a CTO already or like a technical co-founder? It's more like mission-driven, passionate, like female founders solving for problems for other women. What, what is that like when you, when you meet a company and there isn't a technical person in the founding team, there isn't a CTO, like, is that, does that make a difference or, um, and how do you sort of evaluate that in a company? Who wants to take that one on? Olivia? I don't mind jumping in on that one because it's yeah. something that we have been discussing actually. Uh, I mean, obviously it depends on what the problem that the company is solving. If it's consumer business, then perhaps it's not as necessary at that point to have a CTO. But if it's a, a business that that is a deeply technical business and they're outsourcing all of the tech, then perhaps that's a um, that's something that would be a bit of a red flag. Um, but yeah, we we it very much depends on on the business that you're operating on. Um, for a CTO for a technical business, I think would be the logical thing. To have um especially if you you want to have proprietary tech in there uh, because that is something that will be the, the competitive edge when when you're approaching investors um but it, it very much depends on, on what your solution is yeah does that does everyone agree anything else to add I think, yeah, I totally agree about uh, the point of if it's a, you know, deep tech startup, you would expect to have a strong uh, technical founding team. But at the same time, I think what's really important for founding teams is to have the ability to be real proper hustlers. Like you might not have the right CTO, you might not have the right commercial, you know, acumen yourself, but you know where to go and get this person who will be your, you know, leader essentially, and like who will be really um, doing the things you want them to do. So I think um, for startup founder, it's more about um, the ability to, to hustle and to go and find those necessary resources rather than even having all the expertise in your own house from day number one. Yeah, I think that, that that's really great advice. We've seen that as well with founders. Um, you just know that they're going to get it done. Um, but yeah, also around deep tech, especially like if something that's, I don't know, like SaaS or, or AI or data and part of the pitch is being able to build, you know, medical software, 
and there isn't a, a technical person on board, it is a little bit, it kind of increases the risk and in the investor's mind, of uh, the risk around the execution of all of that. Awesome. Okay, that's helpful. Um, keep keep some questions coming. We'll, we'll keep weaving them in. Um, also wanted to talk about um, finding angels. Um, so first round VC, obviously not most likely not going to come in um, to invest in the first round. It's probably going to be an angel, maybe a family office. If you don't have already a network that you can tap into of high net worth individuals, where do you go? Like, what are different places where you can expose yourself to angel investors and start building your network out? What, what are some of the starting points? I think it's important for any founder at any point in their journey to actually mingle, mingle, and mingle, and to really get the word out about their startup. What do you, what you really need to do is not necessarily like, not all of us have the right connections and networks, right? But what um, sometimes startup founders forget is that you just sit quietly and nobody really knows about your company. And that's like one of the biggest mistakes. You really need to get your name noticed you need to get some buzz going attend as many you know relevant industry events as possible um, try to speak to on the panels like if you actually have something to say right participate in all these networking events because that's the only way to really get yourself out there and uh, investors um, at least from our perspective here is we love to invest in founders who are actually out there who we have heard about somewhere else rather than just like nobody has heard about you and you're writing me an email and I'm like don't even really know where to actually place you and how to connect to you you know on a sort of network level right so it's just being out there and creating the buzz about yourself is actually a really good starting point thanks I, I was going to add um, obviously um you know, there are networks like in like Alma Angels and Ventures together because, uh, um, you know, Charlie's team, uh, Charlie's co-founder probably reached out to me when they were raising the round for ancestors and said, oh, we know that you're interested in this. And I said, you know, I have a competing investment in in the femtech space and a business called Planera for me, you know, female hygiene, not sure I would do another angel bet in the same category, um, but, you know, did refer him to Alma and they did have some outreach from Alma. So, you know, reaching out to people who might be able to connect you to other people is almost act as your wingman or wing women and open up their networks to you. And there are lots of people like that. I know Eva does it all the time, right? So if, if it's not for me, who else can I, who else do I know might be interested in something like this? And then there's Angel Academy, which has been there for a long time. I don't know how much femtech they do do. And then there's early stage SCIS funds, you know, they might be interested, it might not be it, because it's kind of like an angel fund at that stage. So, you know, I always refer to people to like Ascension, or um, there are a few others, and I send those names, and I like these people might be interesting, because they're coming in at the same stage as an angel, for example. Uh, but it's not easy, because there's only like, I keep going back to the same places. So it's not like there's, you know, the, I'm sure there are new angels also, the ex-operators who are now investing, you know, who've started angel funds. And now there are lots of micro VCs who come in at the angel level. So, you know, like C Ventures or, or Saloni's uh, fund. Mm. Uh, I think it's called Pink Salt, you know, those kinds of, because they're smaller and are coming in at that stage rather than maybe a speed invest, which is, you know, slightly later and and would want to see uh, you know in certain categories you know we come in at pre-seed as well but in certain categories we definitely want to see more traction rather than less we should also probably mention you know octopus has just launched the first uh, check fund right Correct. the first check fund yeah, exactly a cis investment so that's essentially access your angel but they can write you know 100k 150 like the sizable amount take the whole of cis essentially so also, same as C Ventures or same as Pink Salt or, you know, whenever they do launch, even, you know, January Ventures will write 300, 500. And now there's a, we've had like this splurge in the ecosystem of micro VCs, right? Playfair Capital's women's office hours as well. I know it's it's more VCs that are on that um on that kind of discussion all VCs. but yeah all it is VCs, all, yeah. VCs but it is still a good opportunity to then get in front of VCs and, and as a practice kind of discussion get feedback um from from an early stage as well I've also noticed um meeting different VCs that are interested in women's health very often a partner uh will also be angel investing on the same at the same time um so 
you never know until you have that conversation. Um, and that's usually not like these kinds of things are not usually advertised on LinkedIn. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's actually super interesting. Um, and uh, I was going to say, say something and it left my brain. I hate when that happens. Um, but yeah, that, that's um, super helpful around angels, like all the organizations you've mentioned. Oh, that's what it was. So you've mentioned a couple of times, SCIS, EIS. I just wanted to explain in case some, some people are really kind of early in their journey and don't know, this is a tax scheme that is applicable specifically for companies that are incorporated in the UK. And um, it's an incredible tax relief for um, investors that want to invest in, in kind of innovative companies. So if you are a UK company, terms like SCIS or EIS, um, look them up and look up different funds that are specifically um, focusing on that because that's that's a bit easier access to capital because for investors, it's, it's um, quite um, de-risked because they get some money back as part of this government scheme. So UK companies are quite lucky in that regard. Um, awesome, okay. Um, another question that we have not touched on at all yet, but that keeps coming up is valuations. So again, first round, like how do you think about valuation? I find it that founders that go through our program like just sometimes are a bit afraid to put a number down or to say a number out loud. Um, what do you base your valuation on? How do you talk about it with investors? And um, how do you do so confidently? Because sometimes it feels like it's a bit of a in the air. Who wants to address that first? I think we can, uh, I can take this for at least for my experience is yeah. um, that uh, you can do all the quantitative analysis you want to come up to evaluation, right? Uh, so if you're familiar with financial models, financial analysis, you can do things like DCFs. Uh, but you're doing that on projections, as you say, that in reality, every investor is making the assumption that you're going to pivot at some stage. And so, you, you know, the profile of your business can look very different in the future to what you're telling them it's going to be now. Um, really, valuation is what people will pay for your business, right? Uh, look at what's happening in the markets at the moment. You know, businesses are taking valuations half of what they were achieving, you know, only six months ago. And, you know, the business fundamentals have not changed materially, just the market's changed. Right. Uh, and so I think uh, it's all about finding whether it's a lead investor, right, or a credible investor that's prepared to take a stake in your company at that valuation. Right. That's going to provide credibility to others that you're at about the right, the right, the right uh, level. Um, and it's not an exact science. In fact, it's much more of an art than a science, in my experience. Yeah, I agree. From the investor side, any thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, as a VC investor, obviously, I think about valuation as the percentage of ownership in a business that you want to buy, right? And as someone who leads rounds into companies, we have a standard. We'll say, oh, we want 15%, you know, ownership. And therefore we would back into the valuation that we think is, is, is you know, relevant at for that stage of company. And then depending on who the founders are, there might be a slight premium or depending on the traction, there might be a premium or depending on, you know, basically you're then going to adjust from that point on. That is, but as an angel, you know, depending on the size of check you write, you're sometimes mostly a price taker rather than a price setter. So as a VC fund, you are a price setter depending on the size and and whether or not you're leading but other than that as an angel and then you're like how much do I like this company do I really you know do you, how big do I really think this business can get but most angels are investing from the heart they're like is this something I want to invest in is this something that is going to at least me you know the other day I told my husband I'm looking at this women's health company and I think I want to do an angel check but it's like a zero or a one outcome and he was like did you just say it's a zero or a one outcome and you want to do this check? And I was like, yeah, but I feel I love the founders and I really think it can make a difference. You know, whatever small check that I'm writing, I can help them and I feel it'll help, you know, it can make a difference, even though it's a really small amount. And he was like, I can't just believe you said that. So, but I, what I mean is because it's a topic I love and I want to be able to support those women. So, that's how I think, but you, technically you should be thinking really like, is this, you know, is this investment going to make me money given it's high risk and, but you can't do much to control valuation as an angel, unless you're writing the 200K, 300K and say, I'm going to price this round. And how do you, so like, I don't know, we can talk ranges or, or is, are there resources that founders can go to, to like pin down what they should be thinking about in terms of valuation? 
and based on what like i'm guessing traction yeah, i think it's pretty standard i think it's you know the first 150 that you raise I mean, there's standards in the market right there have been uh in terms of and every cycle that changes shift up and down slightly right so what was what we might have been buying it uh buying in, in last year at a seven or eight eight seven or eight percent ownership we now want double of that so that standard has changed or shifted but uh, there's lots of materials on the internet um I'm, I'm not sure i can particularly point to anything but i'm sure there are lots of blogs have been written and also about how not to give up ownership uh, you know, to things without uh, you, them being real value to you as an organization and not to give up too much equity, whether it's to advisors or, you know, whatever be it, you want to make sure that you're getting money for your equity or value, significant value for your equity, especially at the early stages because the price is lower. Cool. Any other, any other thoughts? Oh, I don't know. I have actually a lot of thoughts on this subject matter. And now that Dipali has mentioned this fact that, you know, not to give up too much equity, I actually have a <laughs> No, honestly, lately, every single female founder I've spoken to has this issue saying, I don't want to give up too much equity. And then they tell you what valuation they're kind of expecting. And I only want to just say, sorry, what you've been smoking, like literally, right? Because I have a feeling that whilst you shouldn't be giving out the equity unnecessarily, you also should give enough equity to investors so they have enough skin in the game to actually get up every morning and try to help you with your business. If it's too little, I'm sorry. There is but, no but, I, but I would argue that most investors have no skin in the game other than capital. I think most, even most angel investors, there are very few that actually are value add. Uh, most investors claim that they're value add, but they really... No, I, I don't think that I most agree, investors right? are value this, add. No, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I won't buy that. That you know what, I'm giving you money as well as value. I just feel that that doesn't come through most often. Um, so, and I also find that women tend to just command lower valuations than mixed teams or males, and they just don't tend to ask. I've had a female founder who raised last year, actually had five term sheets at Seed. And she, when I spoke to her in December, she said, I said, how much are you going to raise? And she said, 10 million. And I said, are you serious? I mean, I was like, are you serious? You want to raise 10 million as a seed round? And she was like, yes, it's either go big or go home. And she knew that valuation at 10 million, right? She knew what the value of that business would be. It's very high, right? She had revenue, but I'm just saying that. And then she went out and got five term sheets. She did not say to any one of them, she said, this is my value, take it or leave it. And she wants to build a really big business. So for me, uh, that's what I want to see from most female because a man does it all the time. Mm. I mean, I, I rather have uh, a business that's going to be really big and have a smaller percentage in it than a business that's going to be really small and have a big chunk of it. That's how I think about it. No, totally. But the same goes from the founder as well in this business. You rather have a smaller chunk of a really big business than 90% of a business, which, you know, is nothing special. But I, again, I don't find this to be a problem for female founders where they're coming up with such high valuations and saying, oh, I'm sorry that my valuation is so high. I, mean, I just don't see that. I have it all the time. I have so many female founders around who literally come out to raise 500k, 10 million. And I'm like, I don't even know where it's all coming and there is no product, there is nothing. And, and I guess different types of founders. I mean, I, I, I also think it's probably a function of the market, probably, that we saw. I think all founders were doing that, probably, maybe not just female founders. I do think I saw deals that got done where it's the same fund offering a term sheet to a male and a female and the valuations were completely different. Both the businesses are at similar stages, you know, similar. Uh, so I have seen the disparity uh, quite up close and personal, but I also, maybe it was a function of the market that we saw these inflated valuations from men and from women, but definitely less inflated from men, uh, from women, sorry. Hmm. Sorry, well, I'm arguing about this. No, this is good. Heating up. That, that's the kind of stuff that makes information memorable. Um, what is it then in terms of traction? So again, like let's just focus like pre-seed first round. Um, when when your valuation is kind of your price, when you name it, um, whatever it is, like are there certain factors that kind of are most critical? Is it traction? Do you have to have the product ready? Like are there certain things that pre-seed that you have to see as an investor before you're kind of ready to to write a check 
Yeah. I mean, at pre-seed, it's different than seed, right? At seed, if there is data, then I look at all the data. I will look at the cohorts. I will look at, I'm sure Eva does this too. She will look at the repeat purchases. She will look at the CAC. She will look at the LTV. She'll, you know, she, when there are metrics, you got to look at them. And at that point, I, we just have a higher bar for consumer because consumer is not easy, right? People have to love the product. You want to see high organic referral rate, etc. Because imagine if you got a great haircut, you would tell your five girlfriends about the best hairdresser in London, right? And that's how you see organic growth. That's how you see people love a product. Mm. So consumer tends to be um, in some ways quite easy to underwrite but quite hard to underwrite as well but where there are metrics we want to see metrics I can't tell you this is exactly what I'm looking for but I will look at repeat CAC LTV retention churn um, all those things that are available cohorts what you know percentage how what does a cohort look like at what point do they stop engaging if it's an app what is going on here is it paid unpaid etc it's basically about what is a real trick in your customer acquisition, right? And is that trick really working out for you? Because the amount of, you know, startup founders, both female and male, you see in the consumer space who just say, oh, I'm just going to go and pay, you know, I do digital advertising. I'm like, amazing, but it's so expensive. And the end of the day, it becomes, you know, literally a game of who has bigger round for marketing needs raised. And, and if you can actually afford to spend it and, you know, you know, and with somebody within your team actually knows how to spend it well, right? Um, but I think in consumer space, having this sort of, because um, customer acquisition hack cheaply at scale is literally everything. Mm. For those companies on here that aren't um, on the consumer side of things as well, you know, I interact with a lot of businesses that that go for more the B two B route and and looking for partnerships or, or going direct to clinics and and especially if you're in the states as well, there's there's kind of a different route than what we have to, to targeting clinics is. So that will be. From traction side of things, um, how far you've got with those those conversations, or how many clinics you've got on board, or, or partnerships with other organisations. I think I'm seeing a lot of companies now from the B two B route as well, trying to target uh, bigger organisations like employers um, as as a as your target. But obviously that's hard as well because at the moment they're getting bombarded by different options of what they can take on board um, for employee perks and, and things like that. So it's yeah, beyond, I, I work more with, with B2B, so I can talk about the, the partnership side and what I'd, I'd look for there um, and, and letters of intent and things like that. It sounds like across the boards, whatever you do, traction, traction, traction in different ways that you can demonstrate it in your pitch um, that is clear that how you're going to actually scale it if you were to be given some capital. There's a question that keeps coming up um, that we can't not ask because so many people have asked it in the chat. Um, Charlie, maybe um, you could you could help us out with that one. How do you think about um, the first precede angel round being raised through safe nodes or the advanced subscription or convertible nodes versus an equity round? Like, what has been your experience? Yeah, I mean, our experience, at least if you're raising in the UK, is most likely you're going to end up in an equity round just because of the tax incentives of SAS and EIS. Um, safes, it tends to be much more, much more utilized in the US, right? Uh, you can go through convertible notes. I have seen a few founders do that in the UK. But as I said, like the tax incentives associated with SEIS and EIF, EIS investments essentially negate uh, convertible notes in the, in the UK for early stage. But it, it really depends. I think like uh, you also have to consider the size of the round that you're going for. You know, I think there's a lot of conversation we're having right now uh, sort of assuming that you know like the first like you know the first raise is you know any number when in reality if you're raising you know like 150 200 300k round or like a sub a million pound round it's very different from raising like a five million round from the get-go uh, all the investors will be going after the traction metrics you'll be expected to have um, so yeah I mean as I said like equity round is most likely going to be what you're going to follow in in the UK and it's going to be what most uh, investors at the early stages especially the angels are going to be used to yeah, we actually operate exclusively on safes um, at Founders Factory. I mean, we do obviously in the States and then ASAs in, in the UK, but because we often will come in between rounds, um, it allows us to kind of come in when there isn't a, an open round. Um, and it also gives that flexibility to, to founders to kind of choose a level that they're wanting to raise it kind of is it's quick checks to come in. Obviously, I know that we have the, the different systems here and, and it is inevitable to have that price round coming, but it, it allows for quick and easy checks often as well. I was just going to add that um, 
as a fund, you know, of course, we want to be able to support the founder. So the support founder prefers a safe or, a, you know, convert, happy to do that. But we just don't like too many converts. You know, it's okay to do it once. When you start having this stack of converts on your cap table that are unconverted, um, I just don't think that VCs like that very much. I also feel that we, uh, even though now you might see more converts because of where the market is at, VCs would still prefer a priced round. Um, so there is going to be this tension between priced and convert. Uh, we, I, 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 we might see more converts in the next few months or the next few years, rather, depending on how long uh, this carries on. But I, I think that um, VCs also might be like, don't want to take the, you know, the pricing risk um, because it is a time where capital is scarce. And therefore, I want to be able to price this round rather than have like a 20% discount in the next round, you know, towards the next round. Right. Have everything locked in and know exactly what you're... And, and then to Charlie's point of like the SCIS uh, convert, um, I can't remember the rules now, but was it, you have to convert within six months to get SCIS? I think that was the ruling uh, because until then we didn't have that. I think this came into effect maybe like two or three years ago and it changed the dynamic of converts. And to be honest, they should get rid of that extension. The treasury should just enable that longer, you know, two year convert to get the SCIS. But as of now, I think it's six months that you need to convert. You can apply. You can apply for an additional six. So you can apply to HMRC okay. for for twelve. And uh, I think in most cases it's successful. Uh, but yeah, six is like the um, uh, like the common. basic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, great. Should we um, do like a last thoughts? Last thoughts. Okay, Kate over here is giving me directions. Should we do like a, a round of um, last thoughts? If there was one thing that you wanted people to take out, take away from this, um, or if there was one particular hack or tip that you had that you think would be kind of would make the most difference um, to apply, what would you share? Who wants to go first? I can go. Just, just mm -hmm. grit. Right, like keep going. Remain optimistic. You're gonna get lots of no's. Uh, you get a lot more no's than you get yeses. Uh, so just remain optimistic, you know, believe in the business you've got and, you know, being the right person to do that. And as I said, uh, eventually you'll find the people who want to back you. Amazing. I can't agree more with Charlie, but to be honest, it's the same for everything, not only investors, the same with customers, employees, prepare for a lot of rejections, but eventually you will end up in the right place with the right people. Hmm. And I was going to add that I think interesting businesses will always get funded. You know, good teams will always get funded no matter what the cycle looks like. And some of the best businesses, as we know, are born in a recessionary period uh, and the best innovations. And we will see some very interesting businesses coming out of this as well. And I, obviously, I do think there's a perceived flight to perceived quality, as I call it, you know, with female founders, you know, second time founders just become more relevant because people are, you know, want to take less risk uh, in a market like this. So it will be hard, but, you know, people like us are here to, to talk and to help and to advise and to guide and do whatever we can. Yeah, and echoing what everyone else has said, I think you know, give yourself time with fundraising. It does become a, a full time job, essentially, when when founders really have to, to commit to it. So um, giving yourself enough time to to prepare and and, and extend uh, that, that period as long as you can. But also during that period, making sure that you are really working to, to optimize your mental health and physical health, because obviously, as we said, it, it, you get a lot of setbacks. Um, and that's something that really needs to be a priority in that time as well. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you all for that. Um, and thank you for all of your thoughts. Uh, super interesting. Um, I hope everyone learned a lot today um, and is feeling encouraged, but also informed about what to do about the first round. Um, just also to let everyone know, um, next week we're doing another session with uh, some of our alumni, early stage founders, um, quite relaxed. You can come ask questions. It's a bit more of like hang out with people that are on the same journey as you. Sometimes it can, can be a bit uh, lonely, so it could be fun to, um, to brainstorm 
and meet each other. Uh, Kate just dropped um, from Femtech Lab the Eventbrite link to that. So hope to see you there. And again, thank you so much to the panel, Charlie, Yeva, Olivia, Dipali, um, like super insightful. Um, thank you very, very much and um, have a good rest of your day.